um, listen to us. You know, listen to us talk a little bit about a project we've been working on in the Inner Ionian Sea. Um, can we? Oh, that that thing is up there, and that's we can't see our title. There we are. Um, so I, my name is Sophia Lin. I'm the head of the Geospatial Center here at CSU, located right upstairs in Morgan Library. And I am joined by Ted Karfakis, who um, is a resident of Greece, but is currently in Brazil. So he is joining us remotely. Um, Ted, would you just like to say hello? Hello to everyone. <laughs> Okay, uh, why don't you remain, if you don't mind, we don't hear the rain in the background. He said it's very, it's raining really hard where he is, but we don't hear that as a distraction. So um, feel free to remain un unmuted. Um, okay, I have. Okay, great. Uh, so the plan for today is we are going to give you an overview of um, this situation in the Inner Ionian Sea in Western Greece that Ted is intimately acquainted with and familiar with, and then share how the geospatial centroid has been involved over the past couple of years in trying to assist by providing mapping and GIS services to this area. And I'll get into a little bit about how and why that came to be. Um, but first, um, Ted will give an introduction to the area, a bit of uh, context and history explain why we call this peaceful place, this, uh, you know, apparently peaceful place, an environmental conflict zone. Um, then I'll say a few words about the power of maps and mapping and, and what role GIS and these kinds of analyses can play in addressing what me might be going on in this conflict area. And then um, we will both then talk about our contributions. Ted will talk a little bit about uh, more what's happening on the ground. Um, I'll talk about centroid things, and then we'll discuss uh, future plans for potential um, partnerships or, or work that we could do together. And we may pipe into each other's slides, and we'll just see how this goes. Um, okay, Ted, why don't you take it away, please? Okay, yes. Okay, hello to everyone. Uh, right, first of all, a few things about where we are. So we are in a corner of Greece that you probably never heard of. Uh, in the Inner Ionian Sea, you probably have heard of the Aegean. We do not have little white houses there. Houses are regular. We live <laughs> like everyone else. <laughs> so anyway, can we move, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, so historical context. Uh, first of all, a little bit of uh, geography. We are in an area which receives a lot of rain, three to four times more rain than the rest of the country because of uh, we're basically considered like a mountain range and then a little bit of plain area so we are quite special in that uh, it's an area which is rich in resources it used to be richer uh, there's been a lot of degradation um, it used to have a excellent fishery one of the best fisheries in the mediterranean it still contains significant biodiversity features, most of the significant biodiversity features on land and on water, sorry, and some on land. Uh, the governments, uh, starting from the 1800s, have really, really wanted to basically do these development projects in the area. So there were settlements, there were settlements of nomadic tribes, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, of course, many of you probably don't understand the concept of a nomadic tribe in the European continent, where they do exist, transhumans. We'll talk about that later. Uh, the island, uh, before the collapse of the fishery and several socioeconomic conditions, the islands had thousands of people. We used to have three schools in Galamos. Uh, governance, uh, we have, uh, we are in an off the grid area. Whether uh, you know you like to or not, or whether people like to or not, the government is keeps trying to put us on the grid. That's why we have very, very good internet in our area. They give a lot of money for that. Um, but generally speaking, the way we do things there is basically less formal than you would expect. There is private property. If you want to talk about property, there are community conserved areas, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Community conserved areas at present are not legally binding entirely. Uh, they're understood and respected. 
to an extent, this uh, this institution has very much crumbled away with the loss of the primary sector, people losing the land and socioeconomic changes. People no longer want to just live. People want to make serious bucks and take over the world if they can. Unfortunately, that's a very modern mentality that has crept into the area. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, now, for nowadays, we have almost no tourism that you could think of. We're actually a passing point for tourism. Um, politically, which will, you know, address that in an issue, uh, perhaps later, we are part of Lefkada Perfect, so there is no direct representation. Um, all things considered, I would say that uh, we are part of the city of Lefkada, whatever that means, but that doesn't mean that this is our government that is responsible for everything, sort of like a mini state in the area. The uh, way local government works is basically it's like the town councils in the town, and then they are, well, should we say a little bit vaguely, uh, they have to protect, you know, the people's safety and the environment as well. So they become one of those bodies that can do it. Of course, there's many other bodies. Uh, the problem with uh, some of these things that I'll talk about later is that uh, a lot of people assume that because it's you know people voted for it, then this should be you know the best consensus mechanism that drives environmental conservation in the area and rights. This is not exactly the case, uh, but I leave it that for another time. Uh, can we move forward, please? Okay, so there have been a lot of changes in the past 60 years. Actually, there have been a lot of changes in the past 40 years. Uh, I can tell you that I remember when, you know, there was no running water in every home. I remember women going around like Africa, taking pots in their heads, you know. Uh, a lot of uh, development projects, a lot of uh, political decisions from afar have created situations, sometimes disruptions. Uh, the most important thing I have to comment on has been the nationalization of the commons, which is something which started very early on, started with the sea. So the commons, uh, they tried to nationalize forests and other pastures, but and other ecosystems on land in the beginning, but then they gave it back to the people. This happened nationwide. Still, there, there is a huge vacuum legally about to who is supposed to manage it after the local governance systems are not acknowledged. Uh, the country was very poor. There was a lot of problem with fiscalization. Uh, several things just didn't work out. Uh, several things also worked out very poorly. Um, a lot of ecosystem mining was something that happened quite early on. Uh, ecosystem mining was a little bit like, uh, how can I tell you? It's a little bit like a Jordan North American context of conquering the West. Forests were systematically plundered uh, in the beginning before there was any you know, legal thing that to, to stop it. Trawlers, which is very important, the big industrial fishing vessels, uh, settlement of nomadic tribes, this happened across the country, but it's happened very significantly a lot in our area. Moving on, please. All right, so moving to what we have right now. So we now have a conflict zone. Now, bear in mind that the conflict is not black and white. There are grays. And why do I mean grays? There are grays in perception. Okay, so uh, we have, uh, on one side, we have industry such as fish farms and the state, the deep state, the central government, which says that we're doing the best we can and everything is perfect and we may not be, even if it's not perfect, we're getting there. You have uh, then local things, the church uh, and international ones. We even have international NGOs in the area. That's because we have a lot of, we still have megafauna. Uh, we have uh, a lot of interest on that. Conservation industry, which is uh, basically rapidly moving into the area. Uh, even though it had a somewhat significant presence before. Central government, local governments, local governments don't see exactly eye to eye with central governments. Uh, in fact, uh, there have been 
And I'll show you later a plan which is the, from the municipality, which is local government, which becomes law of the state after it gets uh, submitted to parliament. And then there is another law from the state for the agricultural exclusive zones, which actually creates two entirely different zonations for aquaculture units in the Irene Rionian. Therefore, you have a class of legislation, even, even though it's actually state legislation. And then we have the EU, which, believe it or not, doesn't always make things better. <laughs> Sometimes it makes things complicated, partly because of the distance they have, and partly because they work a lot with specific international NGOs and the state. And at the same time, the uh, whole situation does have a, a situation where we, for example, we have a, our organization, we have a uh, clash with some of the things in the EU, but the EU likes organization that actually help it. Why? Because it's, they don't have the money to do certain things and organizations come in and say, we'll do it. Shall we move forward, please? Indigenous and community conserved areas. I think that some of you uh, these days, hopefully, when I was an undergraduate, for example, we hadn't heard of the term. Uh, for us, it was just the state and, and public and private, sorry. Uh, indigenous and community conserved areas. These are areas around the globe. You'll find them everywhere. Uh, they are areas where conservation is taking place directly by traditional communities. This includes indigenous people uh, they are there is two categories sustainable management and conservation of the species sometimes conservation is done because the area is sacred sustainable management is done through village council or village of elders uh, sometimes it's de facto rather than in practice or, or deliberate as we call it relationships can be disrupted there is a very big problem with the states not identifying these things in many countries, and this is more acute, some would say, in the global south, and especially in environmental conflict zones. Uh, although the main problem seems to be just the recognition of these systems and recognition of the, uh, basically, the governance systems. Uh, there is some work done at the level of the United Nations. I have contributed somewhat to a paper with that, with the United Nations Environment Programme, Let's not talk too much about this. Now, shall we move forward, please? Okay, so this is part of the work that's been done by the organization in mapping what we call community conserved areas or potentially community conserved areas. Although with the way we see it, this is very uh, much the case with uh, the, the sites we've been finding across the country. This is for the area of the Inner Union. You can see that the little uh, green star show community conserved areas. Uh, on land, it's usually for now forest. Uh, we actually, from where we put up this map, we now have found more, we found community areas that are, for example, agricultural land, like uh, commons. Some of them are uh, sacred lands. Uh, bear in mind, sacred land does not mean that the church was in charge. Sacred land means that it was sacred. And the council, council at least, for example, the island next to Calamos Castos, uh, it meant that the council actually managed it, even though the land was sacred. Uh, slowly, uh, the church actually managed to basically manage these lands directly and abolish these councils. Uh, the same thing the state did with the traditional governance systems. Anyway, let's see what we see here. First of all, we see communities that are traditional, that we found have always been there. Lefkada, for example. Although there are a few communities in the coast of Lefkada, for example, that can be regarded as more recent. The Red Pyramids are basically communities that the government created. Uh, these are government-created projects. They are settlement projects. You can see that we have examples on sea as well. We have, of course, on land, we have forests, we have pastures, especially and tribal uh, pastures on the mainland of Akarnenia. You do have the sea uh, in our area here, in the Inner Ionian. Uh, I would like to tell you that uh, for the sea and for some of the, not the traditional pastor, for some of the forests, especially the laurel forests, if anyone is interested in conservation laurel forests, just check it out, we have them. Um, the important thing here is that the, why I, we asked locals during the participatory process and they told us that a lot of these things were regulated 
because they were just so valuable resources that could either be plundered from the outside. So they wanted to regulate that. So I repeat, this is very important. Even the fisheries, there was, and the law of forest, because there was a danger that people would plunder it from the outside, they created these governance systems primarily to protect from that. Of course, the problem is that when the plunderers were actually state sanctioned and had state licenses, and <laughs> that, that that made it impossible. So shall we move forward, please? Okay, what is a conflict zone? Uh, all right, so I will not go into the exhaustive literature of environmental conflict zones. I will just go and find what Wikipedia says. Environmental conflicts, social environmental conflicts, or ecological distribution conflicts are conflicts caused by environmental degradation or by an equal distribution of environmental resources. In our area, this is very much the case. I can tell you that uh, what is also interesting happening as part of the conflict zone is as uh, we have had loss of fishery, we have had loss of forest areas, we have had loss of pasture areas. They have been degraded most severely. Industries, of course, get the first day, uh, say. Uh, there's several industries that are already here. Aquaculture is probably the one that requires most land and waters, uh, although the wind farming and the solar farming industry are moving in very, very rapidly and they do require a lot of land. Most of the land uh, that is uh, being, uh, you know, uh, challenged upon by this whole situation are the nomadic tribal routes, a common pattern, the nomadic tribal lands, because they're big areas and flat and open. They're always wanted by industries. Uh, it is worth noting that there are planned industries, oil and gas exploration, including fracking, off-road or wind farms, luxury tourism, including safari types. And uh, the conflict with the conservation industry, I would say, has just started. Um, conservation industry has moved into the area. Uh, we have uh, seen that. Uh, it, we did have some light presence before, zoning of protected areas, uh, de demarcation, all of that stuff. But now we have, have them as well. So if you, it's, a it's a matter of taste, but the conservation industry is here. The first thing they tried to do in one of the villages was to actually manage the water supply using a basically an NGO. Uh, we were part of the movement with local communities against that. And the whole situation is brewing up more and more significantly. The government is hoping to solve it by force, not exactly physical force, but legal force and politics. Local uh, governments are not very much in favor of certain things, although part of that is, I would say, largely political. They have to do something, and they're doing it. And uh, I, although some of it, I would say, is more in the realm of more typical. So shall we move forward? Okay, and in all of that, there is, uh, you know, us as well, a small project, a small uh, local community-based organization, and we have a biological field station, biological field station that was established specifically to halt and push back all of this situation by first collecting all the data and doing work that was needed. Um, it is now a little bit better than these four photographs. We've refurbished and added some things. Uh, there we do research and welcome researchers and students from around the world. Some help us with our work, some do their own work. We also have some tourism around. Uh, with respect to this, it is, I repeat, in an off-the-grid community. Okay, so bear in mind that this is not uh, this is not in one of the places that you would expect, like some people told me, ah, it can't be that different from southern Italy. I told them, no, it is not. It is an off-the-grid community. It is one of those places that, you know, like you go, for example, like I am in some, I have been to some off-grid communities in Central and South America, you know, that just don't follow exactly the rules you would expect in bigger places or the rest of the country. Uh, so shall we move forward? Okay. What is the main problem with addressing the conflict? There is a lack of data to even begin meaningful analysis. And unfortunately, a lot of this is uh, because there's not, I would say, I would like to think it's a matter of funds for all of this and interest. Right now, the government's pushing all these spatial plans 
uh, and it didn't do work for the past decade or 15 years that it should have and so that they can you know get some fines and some eu regulations sorted they are moving ahead at a speed that we don't find acceptable uh in any case uh there have been social disruptions there is an issue with historical rights throughout the area uh there have been conflicts even there is a, a light conflict between communities uh, why? Because there's, for example, the mainland communities, which after the whole area was degraded, they went into things like fish farming, and fish farming is done in our waters, <laughs> and uh, you can understand that creates some conflict. Uh, we There is the roundtable approach, uh, and it has been suggested by other, by the conservation industry in the area, some very high-ranking people in the conservation industry, we have said that it is not fair. The communities are completely marginalized, completely un uninformed. And what is very important is you sometimes tell people in the area, you tell them this is it or this is what's going to happen. And they're saying, come on, man, it's not going to happen. It's, not going to happen. It's, it's, not, it's just not going to happen. They're going to dare do that. Um, communities, unfortunately, are not like, in, for example, right now I'm in Latin America where communities know that when, when the government comes with these plans, they know that they're going to happen. Or when a licensing comes with something or when a oil and gas exploration block comes in, they know that they have to do something, at least a portion of the population. Uh, the conservation industry in the area at least seems to have a very good relationship with industries and the government. Basically, why? Because they were part of the spatial planning process, although some of them don't want to admit it. And they got... Uh, you know, to de design the conservation zones, the strict no-go areas as well, or be part of the process directly. And they're happy with it because they think it's the best thing. And they also view it as a draft plan. They're saying, okay, whatever, let's get started with this now and we'll see what it works. Problem is that the people who are making these decisions are not even from the country, let alone from the area. Uh, so you can understand that it has a very cold. I mean, for example, people come from, from biologists come from Spain or from Italy, all of that stuff, and uh, you understand this is not their home. So a draft plan, which they would probably never accept where they lived or next to their house, is something that happens very much in our case. Independent analysis is required. Uh, local community organizations are right now the best thing we have, the apolitical ones, and they do exist. Others are basically, I would say, too politically correct. <laughs> For our, for our taste anyway. And that brings us to the baseline biodiversity studies and mapping for ice. Now, baseline biodiversity studies, you'll hear the term a lot. It exists, uh, you'll hear it uh, in, in, for example, where I am now in South America, you'll hear that uh, communities, traditional communities, indigenous communities are initiating their own baseline biodiversity studies. So that's what we're trying to do for this traditional set of communities. The decision of what needs to be done should be governed by need, practicality, and the law. We have been doing this since 2015. Uh, I will, people will ask me, you know, and people ask me, how do you know what you are doing or what you're prioritizing is correct? I would tell you that it's quite simple because. The conservation industry is exactly trying to do, and in collaboration with the government, trying to do exactly what we have been doing since 2005. It started it three years ago, uh, all of the specific set of studies that were needed. And we told them, we told the state that we're doing this, but they're not stopping, which is not ethical for biological research. But in any case, it's what it is. Uh, there's a parallel with draft attempts for zoning. Uh, the draft attempts are basically, I put it up on the internet for a month and you can public, you can participate in the public debate. And if you look at that, you'll see absolutely no analysis versus results. So there's no correlation between analysis and proposed zonings and management interventions. Uh, if you ask locals, including locals that have their areas being put like in strict no-go areas, they'll tell you that species doesn't exist in our area. For example, there's species of fish where on earth did they find that? You know, these are people who have, you know, been nurtured in these areas. Uh, so there is a lot of error going around. 
approach uh, from their, their side we deem as inappropriate for the task at hand. Uh, it's basically running after the government wants to do things because industry is screaming, the EU is screaming, and the government just is trying to do things that should have been done 15, 20 years ago in a, in a slow process like they've done in other places. Uh, at the same time, it's very important and crucial to say that the it, it seems that the conservation industry and the government doesn't want to take the risk of having the, the, the community say no. Okay, so it's trying to do things uh, a little bit behind the closed doors. So you have the common pattern of, you know, decisions being made behind closed doors closed door by government, technocrats and the industry. So obviously, as an organization which is community based, we do not accept that. Move forward, please. So there are several types of studies we're doing, participatory mapping and mapping for rights including social, ecological, and historical research, studies of keystone species for the protected area, the monk seal. The monk seal, you should know, is the most endangered seal species on planet Earth. There's only 600 individuals left. Uh, our area harbors, I would say, a lot. Um, some, there were estimates on 7%, but I will now provide some rough data based on our extensive network of 38 sampling stations, camera traps, etc which takes it even maybe more than 10%, maybe even 15% of the global population in a small area. That is a lot. And you understand that that means a lot of things. We are doing other types of biodiversity studies, including entomological collections, GIS studies. Literature surveys are very important. That's because this is what the government actually did after us. So we did the literature survey for, for the area as well when we were still you know, doing the, the analysis, and they did literature surveys, and we submitted that, and it's completely different literature from what they looked at. They had like a list of two pages of literature for an 800 year dog. We had like a big paper that uh, you can read later. Anyway, shall we move forward? Okay, uh, so I think this is uh, your, your part, Sophia. Yes, that's right. You can take a break now. <laughs> Great. Um, so with that context, um, the question is, is how can maps and GIS potentially play a role and what have we been able to do to contribute to this, you know, these, these studies that have been going on? Obviously, we're not locals, but we respect the locals and we're just providing sort of technical assistance there. So when we think about mapping, um, hopefully those of you in the room and online know that we can map just about anything. I mean, it's not just your traditional what is where, but we can get into mapping rights and we can get into where species were. We can get into how forests may have changed over time if you have the right data or the right imagery or whatever. Um, so it could be natural resources, it could be cultural resources, rights, et cetera. So part of what we've done in gathering these, the data to find it is sometimes from the literature, from existing maps, and sometimes it's actually gathering and creating the data ourselves and then pulling it into a GIS or some sort of way to be able to overlay these data so you can see where the conflicts may exist. So our contributions, as I mentioned, were both local, like on, on site there and remote from here. Um, some of it was georeferencing existing maps and then field data collection a little bit as well. So these are just samples of maps that we found, again, from the literature or from reports or whatnot. And I want your eyes to follow the, the little black uh, rectangle because that is our area of interest. That is the Inner Ionian Sea. And of course, these maps are at many different scales and for many different purposes. Um, but just so that you can see, you can start seeing spatially how these things can cause conflict. So we see the aquaculture development zones. We see potential for fu future tourist development. We see oil and gas exploration. And on the lower left there, we see that there actually has been a declared underwater archaeological sites. So what do you do when the country is saying, for instance, that the archaeological sites should be protected, but they're also saying it's okay for oil and gas exploration? So these maps help us see that that's where these conflicts can be. Not to mention, 
the uh, biological resources that are there too. And we can have maps of those as well. And there has been some of those in the literature. So um, I'll show you a map on the next slide, but the Inner Ionian Marine Protected Area is a special unit of conservation from the EU. It's part of the Natura 2000 um, efforts, which is there are different levels of, of conservation. Um, but the area in the Inner Ionian Sea has been determined to be worthy of protection because it has you know, special conservation value. Um, interestingly, uh, this designation from the EU, it actually leaves it up to the country to enforce it and to regulate it and to manage it. And so there can be questions there too, like especially as Ted was talking about when you have governments involved, but there's some conflicts about what should be the reason. Should this be developed or should this be conserved? Or, you know, and and if and who's making those decisions and how can that impact, especially if it's up to the country to decide how this place is going to be conserved or managed. So for instance, as you'll see in the future slides, even though this area was meant to be conserved, the people that were probably in the room also had some interests in fish farm development. Uh, so this is sort of one of our favorite slides to show this. On the left, you'll see a map that indicates what the scientific community said ought to be the protected area in the Inner Ionian Sea. And then on the right, you see the actual shape file that I downloaded a number of years ago from the Natura 2000 site that said what the actual protected area is. We'll get into that. Take a look at that. Hmm, curious, isn't it? <laughs> this is showing population, but also where the where aquaculture is in the area. So that was just a smattering of some maps. And now I'll just give you a brief overview of how, um, frankly, how I got involved and how the center had gotten involved. So in the summer of 2018, I had the opportunity to spend two weeks on the island of Calamos. And frankly, I just responded to an ad that I had seen looking for volunteers. And, um, and you know, they said, if you have projects or other interests, just write. So I, uh, I just sent a message to Ted and we had a chat. I said, I manage a GIS center here at CSU. And he was like, yeah, come on over. We'll, we'll, we'll put you to work. We'll find some, some GIS work that you could do. So I worked on three projects that year having to do with um, mapping fish farms using Google Earth. We'll look at that in a second. Trying to estimate um, the coverage of Posidonia oceanica, which is seagrass, which is a protected species in the area and then starting to work on participatory mapping, which means engaging with local folks to try to remember and understand what used to be in this area. Then I came back here to CSU and gave a presentation sort of very similar to this and uh, invited students if they wanted to come the next year that we could probably do that. So I went back the following year with three students from the Geospatial Centroid and we worked on a few other projects, um, including georeferencing, uh, historic imagery from the 1940s from the British Library in Athens. That was quite interesting. So we had black and white aerial images that we were able to stitch together and overlay again in a GIS too. Um, and then we did participatory mapping as well. And then finally, one of our students had just gotten his drone license and purchased a drone. So we brought that along and were able to capture some high resolution imagery of the area, particularly looking, trying to look at seagrass also. And then since then, uh, most of the work, I mean, the work has just been remote. I haven't been back since. There were some ideas, Connor, we, we, we're almost gonna go this year, but that's not gonna happen. Um, and then one of our affiliate students, Melina, is probably gonna go this year on a different, but a related project. She's gonna be trying to do participatory mapping of the forests on the mainland. Um, okay, so just uh, again, I mentioned briefly what we did, but now I'll, I'll take it a little bit deeper to show how we were able to do these uh, actual geospatial tasks. Um, so again, estimating seagrass, looking at fish farms, participatory mapping, and then the final one that, that uh, Ted will talk more about too is, is mapping the historic nomadic routes on the mainland. Okay, so back in the day, these were the maps that the government had provided of saying where seagrass existed around the island of Calamos and in the Inner Ionian Sea. And those of you who, you know, play around in geospatial stuff, you could see that these grid squares are a little bit rough, aren't they? These are one kilometer square grid squares that are saying the presence or absence of seagrass. Not very helpful, really, when you're trying to actually say what is truly there. So. 
um, Ted and his other volunteers, uh, some of the volunteers actually go into the water and do stem counts of seagrass, and they are tracking this data too. But as you can imagine, that is very extensive and, and time consuming. So we thought there's got to be some middle ground. So the first year that I was there, I came up with this methodology of using Google Earth imagery and, and these grid squares. And we had, there were five other um, volunteers there at, at the time that I was there. They were just, you know, college age students from around the world that happened to be there. And um, so I came up with this task for them to see if we could do a better estimation of seagrass. So I gave them each one of these grids um, and then asked them to estimate just by their eyeballs, not using any kind of formal remote sensing techniques to just estimate what percentage of each of those squares they thought was seagrass. And as you can see, the darker areas are seagrass. So, you know, our eyes are very powerful and we could actually do this. So then I had a, a recording sheet for them to, you know, for each of the squares that they were doing, just estimate that percentage. So this is what it looked like. I had no idea if this was going to work or how it was going to work or how long it would take. And interestingly, it took about a half hour and they finished all of their grid squares and they were able to, to do this pretty decent estimate. So even though I have to say this was not actually formally analyzed, it was a proof of concept kind of thing. And I think it was it was pretty effective. So that was that was one uh, task. Of course, the next question is, well, can't you use real remote sensing techniques to estimate seagrass? And this was five years ago. And I have to say that it, it has come a long way. The efforts that I had tried, and I even worked with folks here at CSU to try to do either classified or unclassified, uh, unsupervised classification to estimate seagrass, it was not very effective, right? Because the, the colors, the spatial signature that you're going to get on these things, it just was not really that helpful. This was the best that we got here and still um, not that great because the darkness, you know, the color that you're seeing, you can't tell then if it's seagrass or if it's depth. Um, but since that, I'm happy to say that there have been more recent publications and these are folks that are really, you know, doing full on research into the best ways of, of estimating it and they've gotten a lot better. So this is a more recent publication that was estimating the existence of seagrass. So I'm impressed with how, how far that has come in the five years since we tried this. Oopsie, woo woo, quick, quick. Um, so fish farms, this was the next task. Um, again, I was with those five uh, students and um, we were trying to figure out, okay, where are these fish farms? And so again, we, uh, oops, uh, we did a task where, again, I put them into Google Earth, gave them sections of uh, area, and then had them just zoom into the imagery. And we had two time frames. There was a 2000, mm, 2013, or sorry, 2008 and 2017 or something like that, two, two time periods. And then they would literally just digitize in Google Earth when they saw uh, a fish farm. Um, so uh, this, uh, Ted, I think this was something that you were going to talk about, but I can dive in here, which is interestingly, if we I'll, look I'll, at I'll, if you want, you want me to, to talk about this? Uh, sure. Yep. And then I'll go back and show the actual work that we did uh, to, to estimate. Okay. It. So just, just a moment then. So. What you're seeing there is uh, basically so, sometimes when you look into the scientific literature, you can find some interesting things. So, for example, we have uh, basically what you can see is pond inside for sardines uh, to your uh, left side, and then a map with uh, the fish farm relative area to your right side. And if you put that, you'll see that it matches perfectly with each other. Uh, so that why because when when people put fish farms they put them in sites where fish can grow well that's a problem because wild fish go and give birth to these sites before their fish can grow as well um so what happens here is that apparently this is just something from a literature this is, shows the mismatch by the way bear in mind that wild fish and wild fish migrations all that so they're not just international they're also national legally protected so what you're seeing here is basically uh, if someone were to pursue it, it could very well be that this is like large scale illegal. <laughs> uh, what is crucial is that we 
you know, this data, I can tell you that there hasn't been any real interest from either the local governments that are supposed to be running the situation or, you know, or the state or whomever. Um, but in any case, what is important to show here is that this is how we have used maps and how powerful it was to actually show large scale discrepancies, uh, environmental damage, environmental damage that, uh, as I said, these fish spawning sites are legally protected. Uh, environmental damage that is potentially very, very highly illegal. Um, another thing that uh, others have done in the area that's worth noting the local government is they tried to map fish farms relative to their licensing sizes and they found that basically some were bigger than they should be. And this is not something that we did. Uh, this is not this is something that you have to go and for the license. We haven't had time to do that. Anyway, Sophia, back to you. Yep. Okay. Uh, so clearly what that is showing then is what we've seen before, that the area where it should have been protected is actually not. And even if this area were to be rewilded, would rewilded, which is part of the mission, I would say, of Tara Silvestris, of Ted and his uh, team or his organization, um, even if the fish were to be to come back, where would they go? Unless the fish farms were actually removed, they couldn't go back to the, the healthy spawning sites. Uh, okay, and then this one also, Ted, I think you wanted to comment on what is now the aquaculture exclusive zones, which okay, is... Okay, so aquaculture shape. exclusive zones, they are a special planning unit of the EU. They are a hybrid between an industrial zone and a sustainable production zone. It is a strange thing as a concept to people who haven't really dived into things. I can understand that. So think of it like one of those, if anyone's ever heard, you know, logging concession areas well consider it like this one or a sustainable development area or a sustainable development area for a specific activity like agriculture this is one of these things um as you can see it interacts there is an overlapping zone with the protected zone this is one of the there's only another area like that in the country that has an overlap with the natura 2000 area um this is important um because uh, it means that they believe that these areas are joined. Some of these areas also for the for some of these plants, uh, basically, I repeat, this is just a concession system. So imagine this is a series of concessions like logging in African rainforest. So this is basically management. The management body for this type of zone, you should know, is a private development company and uh, the and it is allowed, it's not allowed for the protected areas anymore because EU was actually chasing the Greek government because it needed to manage the protected areas so it just decided to give it all to the state. So you can't you can't manage a protected area like you do, like for example, in Africa, organizations or companies, they can't do that anymore in the country for that reason. Uh, but in this area for the agriculture exclusive zones, which do indeed, you should know, do have on their own a conservation component right now in this area which is in the state law you have conservation activities for example in the south they're planting shellfish that have been you know destroyed by pollution and although some people would tell you this is all like perverted you cannot have open cage marine industrial agriculture uh, you know, and that, and be, so they're treating it a little bit like agriculture in the land with agricultural practices and all that stuff. This is obviously not something that, you know, most experts that I know of would agree. But in any case, this is it. It's there. There is a lot of conflict, a lot of political pressure for it. Regrettably, there's also uh, the desire to exploit the situation politically uh so that's why we're not part of certain groups or we don't collaborate with in the area uh and i think i've said enough sophia move forward please okay carry on uh so participatory mapping uh, i'm not going to go into this too much but this is just um as i mentioned briefly uh the opportunity to take the memories of the local folks, people who had been around for a long time, who remembered what used to be where. So this was in the summer of uh, 2019 when I went back with CSU students and we met with this one gentleman, Bobby, who, who used to live on the island and then lived in the US for many years and then returned. And he was just remembering, you know, 
the sea here used to boil with fish, he said, and he would talk about how the different um, communities, either on the mainland or from the islands, would have their specific fish that they would fish for. And so as he was talking, we were drawing, he was drawing, and then Riley, who was our, our student there, um, he transferred that into an interactive web map, which you see down below, that's showing like which which species were where and which communities were actually managing that fishery. So it was actually a very functional system, if you think about it, economically and ecologically, because it was sort of imbalanced back then. And now it's just, it's it's not so much that way anymore. Um, okay, we're gonna shift now to talk about this uh, historic nomadic routes. Um, so Ted had approached me and said, okay, we have all these maps that show transhumance, shows where the, well, there were these different groups, Sarakatsani and the Vlachs, of this Balkan area and where they used to um, migrate yearly to come down for, you know, with their animals to go to pasture lands. And so these uh, historic maps were representative of, of, of where these groups went. So my task was to take this and try to turn it into something that we could then overlay with other GIS uh, layers. So this is sort of what it turned into. And let me see if uh, I can I can show if we have time, I'll go actually to the live Arc, Arc Pro project and show that essentially what it was was I just took these maps here, brought them into Pro, geo-referenced them as best I could, you know, not knowing it. There was a little bit of, you know, as you say, like kind of ru rubber sheeting, like making it fit, um, and then going in and digitizing the lines that I could interpret from which which groups they were. So um, then I ended up putting this up in ArcGIS Online so that it was uh, usable. And then and Ted and I actually presented this uh, a, a while ago for the Royal Anthropological Society. People were quite interested in it. But interestingly, um, Ted, you can take it from here to talk about the impact of the efforts of doing this map and, and how it affected okay. uh, the development of wind farms there. All right. So there is in the mainland right now, there is a huge amount of license uh, applications and, and a very, very, very high rate of creation of these incredible mega projects for wind farming and solar panels, uh, solar panel uh, uh, areas. Um, the important thing to note with all of this is that people sometimes tell me, you know, wow, why is that bad and all of that stuff. I tell them, why don't we have a look at certain of these things and how they impact local ecosystems? For example, I'd like to tell you also, for example, if you look at these maps, if you look at the, there is red and there is green, green are areas that you can see uh, that some have gotten their installation last and some have gotten rejected. Actually, we believe we have been instrumental to the rejection of quite a bit of these things. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. But what is important, every project like that, if you look at where, you know, where is, uh, for example, if you look at, Sophia, can you show a little bit where the town of Mythicus is? Uh, uh, the, yes, exactly. So that is the town of Mythicus. The other projects are actual sizes. This is huge. For example, the projects that are red right next to Mythicus, these used to be 25 million euro projects. We're talking about mega investments in the area. Uh, of course, the, the country is facing this challenge elsewhere. But what happened here? So you have, obviously, the nomadic tribal routes here and where they end up. So you can see uh, we have submitted these maps to the public debate for the, for the licensing of these things. And you can see that they fall perfectly on, actually, the <laughs> these proposed projects. Uh, why? Because uh, they are nice, flat, open areas, the nomadic pastelands. Uh, when uh, searching a little bit in the licensing portfolio for these projects, we found that even though these are clearly areas which are traditional pastures from humans, potentially community conserved areas, some of them have a notified conservation value, there's important values such as intangible cultural heritage and all of that stuff, and uh, they're still being used as pastures. By the way, you should know that even though it has had been declined, even though of all of the the transhumans has been greatly suppressed. There is still nomadic groups 
You should know that last group that moved on foot from one of these groups was early 90s. So that's not a very long time ago. And there are still groups that are moving in and out in the summer and winter pastures for the area. But moving forward with this, we found that these areas were defined by the local civil construction authority or the local community village council authorities, the local governments basically, as no specific land use. And we jumped in and said, excuse me, this is not the case. There's specific land use. There has been specific land use for centuries, some cases thousands of years. Um, and basically that was very significant. What actually happened was very interesting. The government didn't seem to actually admit all of these things. Even the local governments, they said they were concerned about some vulture colonies in the area, which are important. We have one of the last vulture colonies in the area. The area of the mainland of Akanani is important for raptors. You should know that. And when I talk with people who are really into birds, they said, wait a minute, they just stuck wind farms in other areas where there were vultures. Uh, what may have happened is that because our work was so impactful, what happened is that they didn't want to admit because if they wanted, if they were to admit, then they would have to get a lot of other licenses out of the portfolio for that. So, and this is just part of the country as well, bear in mind. So what happened is we think it had a very, very significant impact. It would have a much bigger impact if we can complete where exactly the pastors are and part of the student that uh, Sophia talked about, Melina comes, is basically find those pastures that even though the governance systems have been basically disassembled to a larger extent, they're still there and the local government has maps and there's people who remember that and will be mapping that more accurately. So if anyone has disagreements with respect to renewable energy and carbon storage and all that stuff, you should know that these pastures and these these ecosystems, some of them are forests as well, hold an incredible potential for carbon. So they're already storing huge amounts of carbon. By doing these projects, you are not storing more carbon. You are creating a lot of problems. Restoring the ecosystems, restoring the governance systems should be the priority. But in any case, I won't talk too much about that now. Next slide, please, Sophia. All right, so this is the plan of the municipality which actually made it of the sustainable development project of the municipality by the way we also have a sustainable development project organization as part of it you should see a few things here first of all i would go into the uh echinads if you can go sophia here the echinads you'll see that there is supposed to be an area of development for fish farms basically they want to stick it all down there uh the municipality is doing that primarily for aesthetic reasons, you know, just stick it back there, stick it behind an island so that no one can see it and all that stuff. Make an unofficial industrial zone down there like an industrial park and hope that it all works out. That's not a very good plan, if you ask me. But at the same time, what happens is that it goes into conflict with the aquaculture exclusive zones because the aquaculture exclusive zones and the studies there suggest that the air, a much bigger area is given and a, and a much bigger development is given and a much different plan is given. So what you have is two pieces of legislation and local government all that clashing with each other. At the same time, to make it even more insane, actually <laughs> the municipality at some point approved its people, the, the relevant scientific board, approved the agriculture exclusive zone zoning. So it went against its own plan at some point. Uh, <laughs> you'll see other things there. You'll see, for example, if you go to Calamos, you'll see that there are plant helipads. Uh, and so what they're trying to do is they're make, to make these, um, let's say, I, I'm forgetting right now the word for airport on, on in the sea, okay? Uh, the environmental impact. Now, what happened is that they didn't do environmental impact assessment for any of this. They just said, let's do it like that. Uh, and it's important <laughs> to note that the, the protected area study, which was not a study as far as we are concerned as an organization, uh, actually tried to do environmental impact assessment at the same time for these uh, airports, uh, which as you see, will be very important developments in the area. Actually, it will be 
it will actually it will take out for example some of our best beaches that tourists go they'll just be turned into one of these uh, all these facilities and the only thing that it's saying basically for impact of the environment you know when you land an airplane or uh, you know a hydroplane sorry just look down in case there are sea turtles so that that's all there is so and then there's many other things here but what is crucial is that its own plan even if you look at its own plan it has for example a development unit we're part of the development unit because we're considered underdeveloped at the same time we have probably most of the biological diversity on both sea and land in the area as far as plants for example we have most of biological diversity in all the Olean sea still we need development and the government defines it much too broadly and at the same time you see it has one plant this year and then the plant leaves this year and then they agree with themselves and then they stop that with themselves and there's nothing other than drafts being thrown in one direction but anyway this is important to show moving forward please We're all right so now, Sophia, we have to open open the the geo node from down there okay. okay open open it open, open it yes so this is there was a environmental impact study done for zoning the protected area the protected area bear in mind has the sea that you see but it does have a terrestrial buffer in the core so some of the islands have a coastline which is protected area shall we move inside okay good now uh, move down and uh, move down please yes move, no no further up further up where the islands are let's see uh, let's see the islands so now please start putting layers okay put the layer for uh go down let's see let's see the uh exist uh, for, for, put the layer basically for for what they're suggesting they're suggesting the strict no go areas oh strict no goes okay that's existing right so there should be one for the for the uh, hmm. go up, go up. This link may not have had all of them. Okay, well, uh, so if I think this link is is yeah, I think it's not complete. Mm -hmm. It 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 has an existing situation, but it has a situation that is proposed. So this no, this is the right link. It's EPM. 50A, so it's the right link. So if you go to filter layers, and yeah, I don't and know. I think it's, I think it's missing some. Anyway, backgrounds. Go to backgrounds. Background. Is it? Sorry, hold on. Let me try one other. This one might have had. Yes, I think it's it's having a, a slight problem, but it is supposed to have all the zoning, and it is supposed to have all the. Okay, so the protected area, I should tell you, has been uh, the way the study was done. It it it, uh, it says it, it provides a set of zones for the area, and it provides a set of management actions that need to be done in order to protect uh, to protect it. Uh, one that includes restoration actions, and it has these um, protected. Uh, items so as we call it, for example it protects it on the basis of loggerhead turtles or in this case it protects primarily on the, log on the basis of green turtles the area uh, bear in mind that uh, green turtles existed in the area they have become for example very rare um, part of that has been because of the destruction of the ecosystems so there are these plants at the same time you have for example if you were to be able to put the agriculture exclusive zone from one you say you can actually triple or quadruple industrial agriculture <laughs> area in the same area but at the same time you need to do some restoration for the green turtles which is doesn't really add up you know how are you restoring habitat for the green turtles and turning it into an industrial zone at the same time important and crucial the lands that you see are private or communal and some and the core protected area itself is private okay uh so that's that's uh, so basically in, in some cases when you're trying to to go to private land without people's uh, permission and turn them into strict no-go areas that's a, some would tell you an intricate form of land grabbing 
but anyway, that was it. Sophia, I think that you can you can move forward from here. Yeah. So I think we're we're sort of out of time. So we'll just uh, finish up quickly about our future work. Um, my plan here, if possible, is to get all of these various data sets that we've compiled over the years into a singular place where they can, I mean, it, it, as you can see from that site where we were, that geo node, a lot of the data sets already exist out there, but we want to have a sort of our own where we can have the stuff that we've created that don't doesn't exist anywhere else, but that can then um, be added to, or we can bring in the, the different layers and look at, at, look at um, them all at once. Um, the, the forest mapping may happen in the future, as we mentioned, uh, the monk seal, the continued Posidonia mapping, although I think that honestly, I, I'm not sure exactly what more we can do on that realm, uh, except for the very, very localized one that Ted is doing, and then um, maybe more drone flying in the future. Uh, the challenges is the just spatial data availability, where to store it, how to deliver it, how to make it editable or not, um, which geospatial tools to use, to collect it, to analyze, to visualize. These are all challenges. And then also the non-technical challenges, which is that, you know, the, my intermittent engagement with this project, uh, language, um, those kinds of things that make it a little bit tricky. And then um, possibilities for future collaboration with um, CSU is to have a more solid partnership potentially. Um, work in ecosystem mapping and potential identification of ICCAs, and then possibly expanding the uh, educational component. One of the things that I've enjoyed most about being associated with this project is that it is a microcosm of all kinds of things that are happening all over the world, but it's in a very, very localized area. And so it's something that is kind of tangible and approachable and accessible to students. And so like, if you want to talk about whatever, I mean, GIS, fine, but also about social issues, historical issues, ecological issues, political issues, all of that kind of come together in this very small place. So you feel like you can learn a lot about it and then transfer those skills and that knowledge to wherever else you might want to explore uh, to, you know, in your, in your future studies. So uh, we have gone over time, but I would like to um, open it up if anybody has any questions or comments on this. I know there was a lot, <laughs> there's a lot, lot to cover. Ted has a lot to say, as you can see, you know, there's, there's, so, there's so much going on there and there's a, a lot of knowledge and complexity there. So any questions or comments from online or here? Yeah. Who are you hoping to see these maps to like make some changes? Yep. Ted, you want to take that? Who do I you want to hear. show these maps? Who do Who you want to show these maps? Maps with. Who do you want to hope to see these things? Okay, these maps need to be shown to any authorities that license things. These maps need to be shown to local people. These maps need to be shown pretty much everywhere as much as possible why uh, because what happens is they the thing is a map is 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 a little bit like a map you use to, to find your way around and you don't find your way around just for doing one thing you find your way let's say you want to, to, to go to a map and you want to see a map to go to a place and another person wants to go for food another person wants to go and find you know some show, some gift cards or something uh for example but uh, so the maps are there to be shown to pretty much local communities. Uh, very important that people need to know what is and what was and what uh, is being proposed, okay? And at the same time, they need to be included in discussions and they need to be taken, I think, uh, also to national, international authorities, uh, and they are. They, I gave you examples of how powerful they can be. They can be take. You can take some of the stuff that I showed. You can take. You can take like whole corporations to port right now. You know. And <laughs> um, so I hope that answered the question. It did. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Anyone online? Um, all right. Well, 
Thanks again for all being here. There are extra cookies for sure. They'll be up in the center. Oh no, I guess it's Friday afternoon. I won't leave them up there <laughs> for the weekend. <laughs> You're welcome to take some with you. Um, and uh, Ted, we'll be in touch. Safe travels back. Um, Good one. Bye-bye. Oh, Thanks thank you. So okay. Bye-bye. So interesting.